Hi guys, Tom Hunt here in the kit room and um, today I'm going to do something slightly different. Um, I am going to turn uh, an, a written article that was published in Le Angler magazine here in the UK. I'm going to turn it into, um, into a video. So the article was on Xander fishing in general and I thought it was quite a good way for me to be able to kind of take you through uh, generally how I approach Xander fishing. There's some really good uh, sort of specific top tips in there as well. But I think what's really quite cool as well is um, as I'm going to sort of read through this essentially, I'm then going to kind of pause, maybe reflect on on some of uh, the stories in there, little, just open it up a little bit so it's not just the article. But um, right, we will start like this. Get yourself a nice cup of tea. And um, yeah, here we go. So, uh, given that this is my first article of my column looking at the technical details of lure fishing, it seems fitting that I discuss, in my opinion, the most interesting and technical of all of the predator species we have here in the UK, the Xander. Throughout the year, I fish for different predators as the seasons change. But every time I concentrate on Xander fishing, be it on the Grand Union Canal, River Severn or the Midlands Reservoirs, uh, I always feel I'm being challenged most and I subsequently learn the most. Xander absolutely fascinate me and it seems their feeding habits subtly change with just minor changes in air temperature, air pressure and time of day. Uh, and they're definitely what I'd consider the moodiest of all of the predators that we have here in the UK. But that changing mood, their finicky nature, uh, I see as not only a fantastic challenge, but as a tournament angler, I see massive opportunities for a competitive advantage to be gained. And if I can find the pattern uh, that they say in the UK, uh, in the US, finding the pattern, um, when others fail to, that's what gives me the opportunity. Uh, this has led to some awesome tournament wins, including uh, Xander Cup win, LACC Predator Pairs Champion, uh, LL Series wins, and LAS Specimen Cup Champion, where uh, Xander were critical as well. So, through my years of Xander fishing, I've noticed two main factors that are worth understanding. Firstly, presentation styles, and in particular, lure speed. And secondly, using the correct equipment. Master these parameters and in my opinion, it will lead you to significantly upping, first of all, the number of bites that you get, but then second of all, uh, you converting those bites into the highest ratio uh, of fish. There are clearly other factors involved in, in Xander feeding behavior. Uh, sometimes I've learned uh, venue specific observations. There's also differences at the time of year, different times of through the seasons. Um, uh, and even differences due to how Xander will strike at a lure, and maybe I'll discuss that in a separate article. Um, so I will. So count on that. Call, uh, drop a link in the comments below uh, or, or remind me to pick up on, on some of those extra things on how Xander attack the lure. Um, but if you understand the two principles uh, and put them into practice, I'm certain you will see the biggest rise in your catch rate. So principle one, lure speed. Sometimes fast is best, sometimes slow or even completely static is best, but finding the correct lure speed for the day and the conditions can literally be the difference between a few odd bites or sometimes none at all uh, and having a red letter day. Now I'm just gonna divert away from the article for a second here because I really want to kind of force this into your minds when you're Xander fishing. We all, to a certain degree, take for granted that the fish are either feeding or they're not feeding during the day. Now, I've already mentioned that I find them the most moody of the predator species that we've got here. And, and the one thing that I want to hammer home with Xander is, if you're not catching, assume that something is wrong with your setup, don't assume something is wrong with their feeding pattern, okay? Because so many times, and I'll go on to, to sort of explain this in a sec, but so many times I've, I've managed to go from getting hardly any bites, 
to finding the right presentation and completely switching on a day's fishing. Uh, whether that's a tournament, whether you're pleasure fishing, but but please, please, please always assume with Xander fishing that there's something wrong with your presentation, not something wrong with their feeding patterns. Right, I'm gonna carry on. This principle really hit home for me a couple of years ago whilst fishing a tournament on the Gloucester Canal. Uh, I was fishing the Allure Lounge series uh, and in practice, we had worked out the absolute best presentation at that time was fishing the lightest possible jig head we were fishing as low as three and a half grams in 14 foot of water, which is very light. Somewhere between three and five grams was about right in 14 foot of water with a lure that had a very chunky wide body, uh, lots of ribs on it and a fairly large paddle tail. Uh, and that was giving a very slow presentation, you know, very light jig head combined with large paddle tail and a nice big body to offer lots of resistance. Um, and creating that hang time. Now, for those of you that don't know, hang time is the idea that you cast out and allow the lure to fall all the way to the bottom. You turn the reel handle one to three times to raise the lure off the bottom, and then pause and keep a tight line. Um, and the time it takes for the lure to fall on an arc, so you've, you've hopped it up off the bottom and you're holding it on a tight line and, and it falls on an arc, the time that it goes from this top bit here back down to the bottom and you often read that by seeing in the braid when the braid is tight and then it just jumps and goes slack for a second once it's hit the bottom, that is called your hang time, all right? Um, this slow falling arc of the lure is the time 90% of your bites will occur with Xander. There are rare circumstances, usually in warm water, when they will chase a lure on a straight wind. And there are also other times when you can target the mid-water pelagic sharpshooting. But those topics, are, I'll cover those in a completely different article. This is what I'd class as probably about 80% of my Xander fishing. Um, uh, for the vast majority of Xander bites and catches, I target the bottom 12 to 18 inches, depends on water depth on the shallow canals that I fish, really the bottom six to eight inches. Uh, deeper waters like Rutland, where we could be fishing 60, 70, 80 foot, you know, you could be talking the bottom three foot, but in relative terms, that, that, that b bottom layer that's very, very close to the deck. However, when fishing the Gloucester Canal, it had been quite hard uh, and, uh, in, during the morning. And coming into the afternoon, the temperature had raised just a de degree or two. A little bit of, well, quite a bit of wind got up, actually. And the Xander came onto the feed. However, one thing made it very interesting. It was really windy. Uh, we noticed a lot of other anglers, uh, due to the wind, had gone up to using much heavier jig heads. And they were probably, just guessing, they were probably using around the 10 to 15 gram mark um, to aid casting in the side wind. But obviously, once down near the bottom in what I call the Xander, Xander zone, their hang time was very, very short. So if you imagine the difference between popping a lure off the bottom and it's got four grams on it, and it's a three inch paddle tail with quite a decent chunky paddle tail on it and lots of ribs, you're gonna get a certain rate of fall, hang time. Imagine that same lure, if I had 10 or 15 grams on, think how much quicker it's gonna be falling through and therefore you're reducing that period of time, that hang time where it's, where it's in that bite zone. Uh, myself and fishing partner, on the other hand, was really struggling to get our lures out. I remember it, we were trying to punch it as far as possible. We were often waiting 20 or 30 seconds between casts, just waiting for that wind to drop when it was gusting, just to try and get it out there as far as possible. Um, casting, really kind of casting 30 plus yards, 30-ish, 35 yards, as far as we could get with that really light setup. But once in the right area, the slower fall was tempting a steady stream of bites uh, and the people around us, they just couldn't get bites. They weren't really catching the, the teams either side of us. But to, um, to prove it wasn't just a location thing, uh, we noticed, um, you know, I think that there you know, was a lot of us all, in, all on a bend, all in a row. I, I believe there was Xander in front of most of us in that area. Um, 
but there was another team that came along and dropped in probably about 40, 50 yards down from us. And they're, they're very famous for, for finesse fishing. And I think they would have picked up on the similar thing that me and my partner Alex had picked up on, uh, fishing much lighter. And so the guys that were getting the correct presentation were catching. So us, the team next to us weren't catching, the team beyond them were catching. And so it, it really was, it made it really obvious to me that when you get the presentation right, there's fish to be caught. And when you get it wrong, you can't get a bite, even though there might be teams around you that are, that are getting bites and catching. Um, so um, on that day, not only did we go on to win that tournament, um, but due to the advantage in, in presentation, it really cemented that valuable lesson about lure speed and hang time. Get it right and there's a great day to be had and get it even just slightly wrong and sometimes you can't get a bite. Now, I'm not saying that the lure has to be slow all the time. In that instance, it was the correct time. I'm just, I'm just saying you have to find the correct speed because there's, there's loads of other times that I found uh, quicker is better. And generally, that's when they're in a very feeding mood or, or the water's a little bit warmer. I've learned similar lessons at Rutland Reservoir early in, uh, usually in early season. So this was a really interesting one as well. Um, you know, uh, some days you can be in the right areas. You can see lots of Xander on the fish finder, but targeting, targeting them with, say, vert jigging. If there's not a huge amount of wind, you're only going at the pace that your boat is drifting along at when you're vertical jigging, which might only be 0 0.3 or 0 0.5 of a mile of an hour. Um, and if it's what I call a casting day, if they're really active and they really want it, then, you know, you've obviously got to impart much, much more movement into the lure and they're going to be reacting to quicker moving lures jerking around. So that's when I would do the opposite to that last story. I'd put heavier jigs on. I'd cast as far as possible. You know, I'd be fishing quite positive. I'd be giving quite a lot of twitches. I'd still be looking for hang time, but it's 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 sometimes the speed a little bit quicker that, that fires them up and gets them ready you know gets them in that biting mood um so yeah as i say here now you could make the excuse as many do that they're not having it the wind's too cold the fish are too pressured they've been caught before they've seen the lures before etc etc there's always an excuse but many a time, a change in tactics to casting, you know, when it's a casting day and fishing faster uh, with paddle tails has seen my catch rate go up dramatically where the fish want a lure moving much quicker. And again, you can often double or triple the catch rate when you find the right speed. In my experience, and this is the main point I'm trying to get across here, you must keep trying to work out the correct presentation and speed. Um, and when you do, it will make the... Uh, it will make you catch fish you were convinced weren't feeding or weren't there. Now, that's the important point. Assume there's something wrong with your presentation. Don't assume they're not feeding. Always persist in trying to crack the code. And if you're not catching, the first thing you should consider is the speed of your presentation. Here's a short list of things to consider in fast versus slow question. Fishing faster will, will be best generally when the water's warm, and I class that as anything above 10 degrees, so anything in double figures. When the fish are active, when they're confidently feeding, so it could be first light and last light, uh, and when there's not been much fishing pressure, so if it's early in the season. I've also found that when the water's cold, if it's in January, the water might only be six, five and a half degrees, um, if it just comes up half a degree or one degree on those sunny days, it's the relative rise in temperature um, that, that can switch them on in, from a slow day into a fast day. So um, it, it's not just whether the water's cold or warm, it's also the direction that the water temperature is going in. Um, conversely, fishing slow is usually best when it's cold, so less than 10 degrees generally. Uh, when the weather has been inconsistent or the water quality is down, so if you've had lots of rain, lots of runoff, uh, road salt that's gone in, uh, the water's become very muddy, um, or, or they're, they're generally not feeding if it is quite a difficult day. 
However much I try and guess what type of day it is before I start, I've been surprised so many times that I have learned the importance of always keeping an open mind. Be prepared to utilize different speeds and different presentations and different lure styles to find the best one on the day. For fast fishing days, think heavier jig heads, think spinner baits or screw in blades, really trying to fire them up. Uh, think Texas rigs uh, if you want to fish a weedless, if you're on a river, for example, and especially going up in the lead size and fishing crankbaits. They're all what I'd class as quite aggressive uh, uh, lures and styles. For slow days, fish lighter jig heads with lures that offer plenty of resistance. Um, fish drop shots with paddle tails, uh, Carolina rigs uh, and Ned rigs dragged and hopped. Uh, and then for really slow days, think drop shot with pin tails, so even less movement, vertical jigging with pin or fork tails and the ability to basically hold it still. Uh, and Ned Riggs fished dead sticking, completely static for five to 10 seconds. So again, the ability to slow the lure down to a to a standstill basically that you can offer with all of those. A drop shot, you can offer it with virtually no movement and even a pintail, a little shake and then hold it steady. Vertical jigging, you can hold it without any movement. Ned rigs, fish dead sticking, again, no movement. So you, I hope you can see how I've sort of planned that out there. The last technique of dead sticking that I mentioned is incredibly interesting. For most of us, one of the primary reasons we love lure fishing is to be active and doing something regularly and making something happen, so to speak. It's completely antithetical to our nature to leave a lure completely still for any length of time. And this certainly happened to me. And for me, I physically have to count out loud. So I'm out there, I cast out, get it down to the bottom. I have a couple of twitches just to see if there's one around, you know, that's heard the plop that might be coming up to it, that is interested in feeding. And then I will, I will basically, you know, have to count out loud. One, two, three, four, little turn of the reel. One, two, and the reason I say it out loud is because you wouldn't believe, if you don't do that, you wouldn't believe how your hand moves before your brain's even engaged. You can be thinking, leave it alone, and your hand just moves because that's what we're used to doing as lure anglers. But um, yeah, anyway, let me carry on. Um, I physically have to count out loud when dead sticking on the bottom and force myself not to move the lure even just for a few seconds. Seven to ten seconds for a lure anglers feels like a lifetime. It does. But on those cold, difficult days when the fish are very lethargic, it is amazing the bites this pause can bring. In my mind, uh, I always fell into the trap of believing a lure was only attractive in essence due to the fact that it was moving. And I used to think, how on earth can a fish be tempted eat into eating a plastic rubber lure when it sat completely motionless on the bottom? My logic used to be that a fish picking up a bit of plastic from the canal or lake bed would be just as random if it went round picking up pebbles or sticks or anything else. It was just, it would be a bizarre behaviour. Um, however... Having seen lots of underwater footage of Xander feeding, I think I've figured out it's not the fact that it's static, it's the fact that it has been moving, therefore seeming like food, but has then stopped long enough for a cold, lethargic Xander to have enough time to pick it up in a way that it is confident to. Now, this is a really important point. Hop, hop, hop. You're not going to get the bite when it's moving on days like this, but you will get their attention. And quite often you have to imagine everything's going in, in, in slow motion. So that cold lethargic Xander. So here's the first scenario. You cast out. Xander sat like this. Hop, hop, hop. He sees it. He just moves a fin. Hop, hop, hop. Gone. Hop, hop. Is he going to chase it? No, because we've already established he's not in a chasing mood. Second scenario. Hop, hop. He sees it. I'm counting one, two, three. He moves a fin. Just comes a little bit closer. Has a look. Little drag. He thinks, oh, there's something there. I'm interested in this. He's taking his time, making his mind up. Little drag again. One, 
two, three, four, bang! And he hits it. And that's why you have to wait because the bites can still be quite aggressive, but you have to leave it in this zone when it's in front of him long enough for him to be aware, for him to become confident, and for him to inspect it long enough to then think, yeah, yeah, I'm going to have a go at that. All right, so dead sticking is a, just try and get your mind around that and have a think about it. When they're, in, when they're in this slow mood, it doesn't mean that they're not prepared to bite a lure. It means they're not prepared to chase a lure to bite it. It is no skin off their nose, so to speak, to not bite a lure. So that first scenario, hop, hop, he's not losing anything by not chasing after the lure. He's not in the mood. He's a bit cold. Maybe he fed in the morning. Hop, hop, hop. Nah, can't be bothered. But when you're offering something that's really, really easy, the risk reward ratio for their for their feeding behavior suddenly becomes, oh, well, I might as well because I haven't got a chase very far. Is I'm you know, I'm not having to expend a load of energy and I'm pretty sure it's food. It keeps moving, but it's not I'm not having to chase it. So and yeah, if the opportunity is just too easy, just too good to miss, they will often then find the in inclination to suddenly be bothered. But if you're not putting in those three to 10 second pauses, you will not get bites on those days. <laughs> Principle two, so moving on to the correct kit. The next concept I'd like to convey, is, and this is a mistake I see all too often on the bank, is incorrect kit, or, or more importantly, incorrect combinations of kit when Xander fishing. The tricky nature of Xander means you have to uh, get means you have to get a lot of equipment choices spot on to really maximize your chances. And if there's one weak link in the chain, uh, if there's just one uh, on the list below that is not spot on or correct, you may find yourself not connecting with or losing a high percentage of chances you've worked really hard to create. First and foremost, consideration is rod action. This is definitely number one for me. And I'll say this one boldly. You must have a fast action rod for Xander. Through action rods are terrible. The reason, is, uh, the reason this is so critical is due to the way Xander feed. Xander do not generally engulf lures like pike do. They also don't tend to nip at, at lures like perch or particularly small perch do. They tend to what I call snap at baits. They hold them across or in the mouth briefly before spitting them out. They're not spitting your lure out because they figured it's a lure. It's just the way that they generally feed. Their conical pointed teeth are designed for puncturing and crushing prey. And they will quite often then spit that prey out um, leave it to often die or just see that it's died. So they'll come up, snap at a bait, if it's a fish, for example, snap at it, maybe shake their head, throw it, which is often what happens when you're lure fishing anyway. That's why these are so important. And he'll then circle round and he'll come and, and he'll come and eat that bait when he's confident to, uh, often when it's dead, because he doesn't want to wrestle with it. He doesn't wrestle with it like a pike would. Um, and the conical pointed teeth, uh, designed for puncturing and crushing prey, um, uh, the reason, that's why you'll never get bitten off on fluorocarbon, because they don't have a serrated sharp edge, which is designed for slashing and cutting, like pike do. So that's why a pike will either fully engulf a lure, or he'll come up, if he T-bones it, shakes his head, he'll, he'll cause so much damage that he'll slice that thing, I mean, Check, check your lures. They'll be, they're all sliced to bits, soft rubber ones. Doesn't happen like that with Xander. They have a completely different feeding uh, routine where they'll come up, snap at a bait, puncture it once or twice, and then let go. They don't long, like to have baits in, in their mouth for very long. And if you've ever done any bait fishing for Xander, if there's any resistance on the line, they can be very, very finicky f feeders. And the minute that something's not quite right, they'll drop a bait. That's, they're, they're like the, you know, in the UK, we have F1s, you know, and like cruising carp, very, very delicate feeders. They're not, not like a regular carp, which would just come up and engulf baits. So you've got to be a bit cuter with your presentation, or you've got to get your kit right and be able to hit that bite straight away. Your lure will generally not be in a Xander's mouth for very long. 
Consequently, a fast, responsive rod both transmits the bite as quick as possible, but also allows you to hit the bite as quick as possible. I can't stress this point enough. Your best window of opportunity to hook a Xander is the absolute second that you feel the bite. A fast action rod also has another benefit in that the power loads very quickly, which is necessary to set the hook. For those that have caught Xander in the past, you may have noticed when trying to unhook them, they have incredibly strong jaws and they can clamp shut and be very tricky to open when, if you're trying to unhook them. I've even had it before where I've struck, where I've had a bite, struck, played the fish to the net, eventually managed to you know, pick it out, open its mouth and the lure just comes straight out of its mouth. The hook had never even penetrated. The fish would just physically clamp down on the lure the whole time that I was playing him. Uh, too, stub too stubborn to let it go and it cost him his freedom for a minute. This phenomenon, coupled with a very bony mouth or head, uh, means that you need the power in the rod to strike through a closed mouth. This is something I've spoken to a lot of people about this and they've never really considered this point before. If the lure is in the mouth and they're clamped down, the only way to get the point to go in to get a good hook hold is you have to move the lure physically in its mouth. And if it's clamped down on it bloody hard, you need to whack it pretty hard and you need to have a rod that will move it rather than when you strike into it, the rod moves by bending even more. So that's why a fast action rod is really critical. Um, so, um, my uh, next one. Also take into account how you set the clutch on your reels. My pet hate when, when fishing for bony mouth fish, so this is Xander and Pike, uh, is a clutch that slips and makes any noise on the strike. For Perch, not so bothered about it. For Xander and Pike, I clamp right down. I don't want anything moving when I hit that bite. I aim for zero slippage on setting the hook. I'm then happy to slacken off uh, during the fight um, after I'm confident that I've made a good hook hold. Some people do worry though. They say, oh, well, what happens if I strike and the fish powers off immediately and I haven't got time to slacken it off? Um, if I can't give it line, I might lose it. So in my experience, A, this rarely happens, and B, this is just a way of we all lose fish for certain reasons, so you just got to pick your poison. Are you going to lose the odd one because you set the hook and then you think it runs too quick before you can get the drag to slacken off, or are you going to lose more if you don't set the hook in the first place? I'm of the opinion of the second one. Uh, I think you're going to lose more if you don't set the hook in the first place, so for me, it's net advantage. The next most important piece of equipment is the braid. You have to have bright colored braid that you can watch for indications. And I say this before, watch your braid like you're watching a float when you're float fishing. There's so many indications that you can read. You know, is it going straight under? Is it quivering? Are there slight indications? You can read so much from your braid. Um, and uh, my preference is for bright green and yellow, but there's also white and pink colors available. Anything that's visible enough so that you can read the braid will be perfect. I can't tell you the number of times I've seen tiny twitches on the braid and not felt anything through the rod, only to strike and there's been a zander on the end and the hook has been decent in the mouth. It's not just like lip hooked, it's in the mouth, it's fed properly and I've virtually not even felt that bite. My final tip is stingers. Now this will surprise a lot of people and is can be quite fiddly. So this is for a lot of you canal people out there. I will even use tiny size 18 stingers on a lure as small as two and a half inches for canal zander. Don't be afraid to put them literally in the paddle tail. Yes, it might kill the action of the paddle tail, but I tell you what, there, there are, well, I think I say this in a sec anyway. Um, I'm less concerned with a stinger killing the action of the lure and more concerned about converting bites. I've had countless numbers of sessions where they've been particularly finicky and I've had 60 or 70 plus percent of the fish and they will only be on the stinger. Without one, that is a lot of bites and not many fish in the net. Just a final note, if there are numbers of pike present, I will use a wire trace and when I do, um, I've found the Drennan 10 pound 
soft strand knottable wire, which is that one there. Hopefully you can see that. And just like to say a massive thanks to um, West Inn, Hummingbird, Minkota and Predator Tackle. Uh, their support in my fishing allows me to get out on the bank and allows me time to write these articles. So something slightly different, uh, bit of an article turned into a video. Hope you enjoyed it. Until the next time, see you then.